Stand up for righteousness. Stand up for justice. Stand up for truth. I truly believe that thoughts are the greatest vehicle to change. We do not care whether the cat is black or white, as long as it can catch mice. We choose to go to the moon in this decade and do the other things, not because they are easy, but because they are hard. Victory in spite of all terror. Victory however long and hard the road may be. To those waiting with bated breath for that favorite media catchphrase, the U-turn, I have only one thing to say. You turn if you want to. The ladies not for turning. Each new discovery leaves in the brains of men seeds, which make it possible for an ever-increasing number of minds of new generations to embrace even greater scientific concepts. Is a quote from Swedish chemist, engineer, inventor, businessman and philanthropist Alfred Nobel. I thought this was an appropriate quote for our guest today, who is the head of a global leading business that delivers superior health and safety protection solutions with continual commitment to health research, advanced technology and manufacturing innovative products. Our guest today, dialing in from Brussels, is Magnus Nicklin, Managing Director and Chief Executive Officer of Ansel Limited. He's also a Director of Industrial Holding Company, FAM, and was previously President of Neil Rubbermaid for Europe, Middle East, Africa, and Asia Pacific, and Chief Executive Officer of Aselt. He also held several senior management positions with Bayer, Pitney Bowes, and McKinsey and Company. Hello and welcome to another episode of No Limitations, a show where we speak to elite world-class performing men and women and unlock the secrets and influences that have shaped their destinies and that you could apply to your own life. For our first-time listeners and followers from all over the world, please don't forget to subscribe on your preferred podcast platform. And for our listeners in France, Argentina, and Vietnam, a big hello. I am your host, Greg Robinson, Managing Partner of Blenheim Partners, the number one research-led executive search and board advisory firm. With COVID-19 testing the global supply of personal protective equipment, and with Ansel positioned at the heart of the industry, Magnus provides us with key insights into the challenges brought by the pandemic, as well as an outlook on the global state of affairs and what a post-COVID world could look like. He also shares with us his journey through an international career, seizing the opportunities presented to him, never compromising his beliefs, and lastly, Magnus speaks about the determination and resolve required in the face of what may seem to be an insurmountable challenge, a principal tenet of leadership. So sit back and enjoy the fundamental cornerstone of leadership. Magnus, welcome to the show. Thank you, Greg. Before we discuss Ansel and the great success story it's been, Magnus, can you share with us a little bit about your upbringing? Where's that accent from? Yes, thank you, Greg. It's a pleasure to be with you. Well, I was born in Sweden, uh, and Sweden is a small country. The global dimension came in early, early opportunities to travel and get out, but fundamentally a very competitive family, uh, four siblings, and um, we learned early on to, uh, to compete for, uh, for attention, to compete to win, and so forth. So, so I think that was probably the most important uh, thing I took away from home. My father was running a, a, a company and we talked business around the dinner table uh, from the age of like five. Uh, so, so that too, I, I guess, colored what you become to a degree. The competitiveness, uh, I, I think, is the one that comes back. And does that lead to the form of the Marines that I, I read about, Swedish well, Marines? Maybe it does because it was sort of the toughest service to uh, join. It okay. was all volunteer, a lot of fun, a lot of challenges. 
working in small units. Uh, it was obviously my first experience as a formal experience as a leader and a great opportunity to make mistakes actually and, and learn from it. And some of the principles that I've taken with me uh, all my life uh, came from there as well. I remember an instance crawling in a muddy field as part of basic training and the <laughs> drill sergeant screaming over our heads, <laughs> which essentially meant you got to love it, the situation. And it sort of comes back to what, what I believe is so fundamental to leadership. There's always something you can like about the situation, no matter how terrible. To me, it's a, it's a fundamental cornerstone of leadership and of being uh, like the situation you're in. Uh, and if you don't, make it better. And when did you actually join the Marines? Was that pre or post university? Pre. Uh, so essentially you join as, as an 18 year old. Okay. Um, and, and then I went to university, uh, my undergrad in Sweden and, um, okay. I got married to my wife, Sophie. And the day after our marriage, we moved from Sweden and we've sort of never looked back. <laughs> uh, so, so we moved to, uh, Paris and I worked for a big French bank and got way more responsibility than I should have been given, but that was, uh, a- another sort of interesting stepping stone. And, and then essentially what I learned from that is take whatever chances you're given. How did that come about Magnus? The actual story to France. At the time, Crédit Lyonnais was the third largest bank in the world. It did a lot of international financing and bond issues and so forth. And I happened to speak English fluently. And some of my French colleagues weren't so capable. Let's put it that way. So, so they asked me, hey, Magnus, why don't you hand, handle this syndication? Or why don't you go and, and take care of this uh, discussion with the other bank in, in the US, or whatever it was. So as a young banker, I mean, six months into the job, I, I was asked to do things I shouldn't have been asked to do. But that too is, is a learning experience, isn't it? You, you do your best, you step up, you, you talk to your colleagues, you uh, learn, you learn fast. So, so my, my principle here is take the chances you give and then make the most of it, right? Where does McKinsey fit into all this then? Well, that, that, that was after business school. So I went to business school in the U.S., Wharton, and worked for McKinsey during the summer between years and, and then actually said no to them and joined the competing firm, but then eventually came back to, uh, to McKinsey and joined them in London and uh, did most of the early work in London and Paris and in Stockholm, actually worked for the Swedish Defense, which was kind of interesting, helping the Supreme Commander get more efficiency out of the subs or <laughs> Uh, out of the army units and so forth. Um, it was kind of a fascinating experience, but most of it was consumer packaged goods. And eventually uh, my wife and I moved back to the US. We were not done with the US, so we wanted to be there. Uh, so I did most of my time with McKinsey in the US and you learn a lot. You get exposed to a lot of different industries. You get to deal with really tough problems. Uh, you learn how to do analysis, you learn how to boil the ocean and, and get to the core data that really is key to the decision making and so forth. So quite fundamental uh, in, in getting a, a set of tools that you can use uh, whatever you do later in life. Um, so in that sense, it, it was a really uh, terrific experience. McKinsey, of course, is a wonderful uh, organization and super global as well. So when you're starting out on this career, you've just done Wharton, you got into McKinsey's. Did you have a view with you want to stay in FMCG and consumer or manufacturing? Did you want to go and do banking or were you just open? Where, where, where did it all stem from? Well, when I went to Wharton, I thought I was going to stay in banking and actually go into investment banking. But yeah. um, I, I learned through interviews with multiple organizations that uh, consulting sounded more interesting because it was felt wider. Uh, it felt more encompassing in terms of business, business management and people management. Uh, and by that time, uh, that was getting to be more and more fascinating for me. So, so, so in the end, I decided to go for management consulting and um, that worked out well. I've, uh, I loved it. I haven't sort of regretted uh, missing out on investment banking. I, I enjoy working with those guys, but, uh, but it's a different world. Was Bayer a client of McKinsey's? Yes, exactly. And, and that's, uh, what happened. I had done quite a bit of work for, uh, for buyer. And then one of their, one of the division chief executives essentially said to me, Hey, would you be interested in joining us? I need to turn around Canada. Uh, I'm losing a ton of money up there. Uh, would you be interested? And, and by that time I had sort of concluded that yes, consulting fantastic, but, uh, you are constantly recommending and you're proposing and you're hoping that the client will take action. Sometimes they do, sometimes they don't. 
Uh, so I was sort of ready to take responsibility myself and, and, and get into a, a, a real driving role. And, and, and that's what attracted me to, to Bayer. Sure, you want to talk us about the, the success that you, you quickly uh, achieved, not at Bayer, but the other organizations before you became CEO of Ansel, because it's a very fast track career. It's been an interesting uh, journey for sure. Uh, I mean, after uh, a buyer, I joined Pitney Bowes, a, a very U.S. organization with some international operations, and did help the then vice chairman, who then became chairman and CEO, to set the company on a new course away from this is essentially postage machines, right? And and uh, the writing was on the wall back then and uh, that uh, regular mail was not going to have a particularly bright future. Yes. Uh, so the company was resetting itself to message management. And, and that's what we focused on. Uh, I remember especially being a bit of a troubleshooter in that company. I was sent out to Japan to uh, turn around the Japanese operation. And that was sort of a fascinating experience. I, I, I had visited Japan before, but uh, obviously didn't know the country all that well. And yet here I had six months to try and figure out what was wrong and, and put it back on, on a good footing and then hire a permanent uh, Japanese president of the Japanese operation. And, and that's what we did. And the, it, it, it worked. And it was kind of a fascinating uh, situation to be in. And the most valuable asset the company owned in Japan was a membership in the local golf club. <laughs> Uh, and of course, we, we sold that, <laughs> but, but uh, my part of that was focus, right? Yep. To um, uh, what really matters to the business and, and make it count. But Japanese are known for taking the time before making decisions. Yep. And it sounds like you're moving at a pretty quick pace. How did you get them to move along with you? I was there on the mandate from the CEO of uh, the company uh, to fix it. So there wasn't a lot of negotiation, so to speak. It was... Okay a lot of analysis, a lot of involving the Japanese team in finding the right solution. And that's, uh, I, I guess, also a principle of mine. And um, if you're going to come up with a plan of attack or, or a way of setting the course for the company, you better involve the team because they need to own it. It's not you, it's them. So if they don't own the solution, nothing is going to happen uh, when you turn around, right? So, so that too happened in, in, in Japan. It worked well, and 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 we, we did indeed uh, turn the corner. And uh, uh, for the next several years, the the Japanese operation was doing quite well. What was next, Magnus? After that, well, I, so so I worked for Pitney for a number of years, and then joined a um, a, a Swedish English company called SLP Office Products in New York, and initially a head of a a business unit, and then I became sort of head of several business units. Uh, I was reporting to the CEO, a member of the leadership team, and then uh, he was asked to leave and, and we got a new CEO. And he and I worked together quite well initially, but in, uh, th then the company had a little bit of a challenge and was losing profitability. And he and I had a disagreement on how to fix that. He wanted to cut costs 10% across the board. And I said, no, you can't cut costs in the jewels that are growing fast. I'd rather cut 20% here and don't cut on the jewels. Yeah, right. And we couldn't agree. And in the end, I said to him on a Friday afternoon, either you and I are going to have to agree on this or you should frankly fire me. And he has to think about it over the, uh, the weekend and on Monday, you fired me. Did you really? And, and, absolutely. <laughs> and, and I was actually quite happy with that outcome. Okay. Now, in, in, in the end, I, I uh, then spent about a year in private equity as an advisory partner and so forth yep. for a couple of firms. Uh, eventually, I uh, was introduced to a former Lehman banker who essentially said, hey, I learned a lot about the office products industry, and, and a lot of people are saying that you know quite a bit about it. Could one buy somebody in the industry and use it as a uh, roll-up platform? I said, yeah, I know, I know one company. It's called SLT. And eventually we, we put together a plan and, and, and took it around to a number of uh, private equity firms and eventually uh, I convinced a, a firm in Boston. Uh, and then we acquired uh, SLT. And my former boss then left and I became the CEO. And then we did what I had preached uh, a year before, and that was to invest aggressively in the fastest growing labeling business called Dymo. And we, we took it to uh, amazing heights and uh, that eventually led to us driving so much value in that business that we sold it to Newell Rubbermaid. Right, okay. 
and we sold it for 50% more than we paid for the entire company. And this was like 20% of the company. So wow. it was a, a really interesting development for that business. So why do you think you were saying things differently to the previous CEO? I'd been there a little bit longer, so I knew the company. Uh, I was very much into the weeds, if you will, of understanding what drove uh, success. I, I just felt that we needed to be a little bit more thoughtful but, but it, was, it was probably just insight and time based and analysis perhaps but but it also tells you something about um, an ability to communicate an ability to uh, to, to get alignment and um, I, I believe that's very important as a leader you need to stand up for what you believe in yeah. and if it's not uh, something you can support and truly live with then either you have to convince uh, the other part is to change. And if you can't, then leave. I mean, you cannot compromise with what you believe in. Never. I, I think that's, uh, that's key. You've got a reputation for moving at pace. You know, the other flip side that we always hear as a search person is make sure when you bring someone into the team, particularly CEO level, that they bring people along the journey. How, how do you manage this when, when you're well known and respected for making things happen? Well, you bring in people who want to change the world. I mean, you, you don't bring in people who want to cruise, right? Um, so uh, I, I think that's first, uh, bring in better, the best people you can find, ideally better than uh, than, than yourself, right? Uh, so that they can challenge you and, and, and keep you honest and, um, and, and uh, so forth. So that's number one. But, but secondly, I, I think when you do bring great people in, you need to leave them room. Uh, you cannot babysit them. You have to give them a lot of room to drive, to use their imagination, creativity uh, to get things done. So, so it sort of comes back to the leadership team. You need to agree on certain principles, uh, but then you need to let the team loose uh, and then keep them to their promises, so to speak. And I think we've done that uh, rather well at uh, Ansel. So we've seen some, some pretty solid results over the years. Yeah, that, that's, a, that's a principle too, is it not? Um, you know, find the best people and give them room uh, to be the best. Yeah, but not everybody does actually go and find the best people. They feel threatened by it. Well, it is. I mean, you, you, you have to keep running, right? Um, and because if you uh, sort of slow down and you're surrounded by these amazing people, uh, then they're going to get bored and they're going to move on. You're not going to hold on to them. Yeah, I, I think uh, it forces you to keep pace too. Magnus, how did the role at Ansel come about? Well, it was one of those uh, recruiting firm stories. I was, uh, I was at uh, Newell Rubbermaid then, had done a, a turnaround in, in Europe, uh, a big rationalization program and so forth. And the European business uh, was doing well. I'd been given Asia to do the same thing. And, and then I got a call from this uh, amazing firm called Ansel. I said, Ansel, what? because I'd never heard of the company before and eventually got to uh, learn a lot about it and um, uh, went through uh, the normal recruiting cycles and was invited to uh, a board meeting in San Francisco uh, to meet with uh, the then board of Ansel in, in, in a series of interviews. And uh, I'd done my homework and stuck my neck out a little bit on what I thought was needed to happen at Ansel based on public data. So, I mean, you there's a lot you don't know when you just study public data, but uh, nevertheless, a few analysts report in public data. And it turns out I was broadly right in the sense that uh, the board had been thinking about doing a bit of an overhaul of the company and setting it off in a new direction. And, and that's exactly what I was advocating. So they, they kind of liked the, I, I guess, the aggressiveness of the vision. And that's how we got going. Why did you actually take it? Because of the challenge of the sense of the scope or the freedom you're going to get and support by the board? A, a couple of reasons. Um, one, I, I wanted to be CEO. I wanted to be uh, the leader. At Newell, I was a member of a global leadership team of a very American company with some international operations. And I was constantly preaching to them about the world is not exactly the same outside of the US. Yeah, right. And this was a chance to be in a global company, yes, which is what I was looking for, and to be the leader. And number three, a company that had a very strong balance sheet. At the time, we had no net debt and uh, had been in a mode of buying back shares for years. 
But that also taught me something else that I hadn't seen in some of the data. And that was the company had not been aggressively invested in for years. Or another way of putting it, it uh, had been milked for cash and that cash had been used to buy back shares. Yeah, right. And you can only do that for so long. Yeah. Um, so uh, clearly we needed to go back on offense and and that was really uh, the plan I was brought in to, uh, to do. It also shows a lack of imagination if that's what the plan's been. Maybe. Um, I, I, I think they, I, I think you have to understand history a little bit. Uh, Ansel, of course, came out of Pacific Dunlop. Uh, which was a bit of a blow up uh, in yes. its days in Australia. The new Ansel, when it became an independent company, had, had one very important mission, and that was to restore trust. Uh, so the way they did that was to always, always deliver on guidance. Right. And that sort of drove the company in a direction to become somewhat cautious. Yes, we will deliver guidance all the time, but uh, they sort of bucked up on extra cash and extra reserves and whatever. So I think the time was right to go back on offense. And, and it's not necessarily to, to fault my predecessor uh, at that point, because uh, it was a different era and a different time and a different purpose. But that purpose had run its course and it was time to go on offense. Magnus, what did you actually inherit when you commenced the role? So we, we talked a little bit about uh, the strong balance sheet. Mm -hmm. so, so that was good. Uh, we had a um, pretty passionate organization. Uh, we're in the safety business after all. We're saving people's lives. And, and that's always been part of the Ansel culture. We feel good about what we do because we do something noble for mankind. Uh, so that was a powerful legacy to build on. And the biggest negative was that risk averse nature uh, of the company. And then we operated in, in three regions and the regions had total independence which created a, an absolute mess at the plants because there were three versions of everything. Uh, so we needed to globalize the company. It was sort of global in name, not in the way it was structured. So we needed to turn Ansel into a global company. And so, so we set it up in a fairly classical matrix with global business units and, and regions, and then working together uh, across that matrix. And, and matrices are not easy, no. but for global companies in multiple business areas, there is no choice, really. So, so that's uh, wh why we went there fast. And, and we organized a, a big event in Paris of all places to set the company off in the new direction. And I launched the, uh, what we then called the 2X plan to essentially double uh, the size of the company, double profitability. And we adopted uh, a new set of values and had the whole management team involved in that, essentially ascribing to the principle I shared with you earlier that get the team to develop the plan of attack. Uh, so we had a, a team and a project called True North that essentially helped us guide the setup of um, uh, the business and set the plan of attack. And it focused on, on uh, really uh, four or five building blocks. Number one, we needed to go back and innovate. So we doubled R&D spending and opened five new R&D centers. Number two, we needed to focus on our brands. In the safety business, you're selling trust. Yeah, right. You need to trust this brand to protect you. Yep. The problem with Ansel at that time was we had 250 different brands. And most of them were tiny. And I was saying to the team, not even Procter & Gamble's got 250 brands. Uh, how do we think that we can maintain uh, 250 brands? And we can't. So we have since consolidated. And now we have uh, essentially less than 10 brands accounting for 80% of sales. So, so we've done a major overhaul uh, of that. Uh, number three, we needed to globalize truly. And that was the, the matrix organization. But also to invest where working hands are. Uh, emerging markets, to invest where surgical procedures are going, emerging markets, the fastest growing economies in the world. So disproportionate investment uh, in, in those areas. And, and then we needed to focus more on selling value, not just product. Uh, so we had actually a tool in the company called Guardian, but it was three different tools in three different regions and only one of them were working well. And it's a tool that essentially audits safety practices in a manufacturing company or in a site. So we will audit, how do you run your business and how do you keep your employees safe? So that audit process, we globalized 
And then we trained all of our salespeople around the world to use exactly the same procedure, if you will. Uh, so now we have 800 or so salespeople who practice uh, this uh, principle of all helping the customers manage and track safety. So we're not selling gloves, we're selling safety. We're selling an outcome. And it's safety and productivity because safety is easy. You can sort of bundle up and protect somebody really well. But if they're supposed to be safe and productive at the same time, it's really hard because now you need to have a thin glove, very nimble, very flexible, uh, and yet protect you against all harm, right? So, so that's become sort of the, the core of what this company is all about, uh, safety and productivity, whether it's in the uh, surgical theater, uh, in the mine, or in the automotive plant, or in our fastest growing business these days, life science, pharmaceutical manufacturing, laboratories, and so forth, uh, where very often you actually protect the product from the human, not the other way around because you need clean manufacturing and those kinds of things. So, so those are some of the principles that we adopted and uh, we've been pursuing them ever since. And I think that's another lesson learned. Strategy and strategy shift is not accomplished in a year or two. It takes time. You have to be consistent and constant uh, in how you apply strategy. You have to communicate, communicate and communicate again. Uh, someone once said that it takes three years per layer to change a company. All right. I find that quite striking because most companies have seven layers. <laughs> that's right. uh, so, so that's a, a lot of years if you really want to change all the way to the front line, right? Absolutely. I think you can probably do it faster than three years, but I think it's a good illustration of the fact that to change a company, you really need to be super consistent uh, and super constant uh, in how you apply strategies and how you manage it and, and so forth. Doesn't mean that you can adapt strategy over time, but you cannot fundamentally zigzag. You, you have to be really uh, a straight shooter when it comes to how you set the company up and how you manage against that. So the formulation of the strategy then and the execution comes from the back of, I guess, setting the vision, which is the role of the CEO bringing the team. So in Paris, going back all those years, this is the big agenda. I'm going to bring them along so they can buy my big agenda, or how did that come about? Well, the agenda came through the team, through our North Star team, engaging across the company. Uh, quite a bit of analysis in the early days. We, part of that analysis, decided that in addition to gloves, we, we needed to enter one other protection category. And we then decided that clothing was to be the one closest to home mm. with the most overlap, the most common reason to sell it as a package, if you will. I mean, we could have decided to go into goggles or helmets or shoes or something like that, but we decided clothing was the way to go. And, and we've been on that journey since. We bought the first clothing company, actually in all, of all places, Sweden, from a company called Trelleborg in 2011 or something like that. And, and since then, we made a, a, a couple of other clothing purchases, and that's now become a core business of the company. And it's approaching 150 million in sales. So it's, it's, a, it's a meaningful uh, driver. And it's uh, obviously through the COVID crisis, it, it became really a critical item. But we set the company up to, to essentially focus on areas where we could be number one and number two okay. worldwide. Yep. And in clothing, when we started the journey, we were number 10. Uh, so obviously, it was a big bullish bet on saying we can win in the space because of the proximity to hand protection and so forth. And we've proven that out. We're now number two in the world. DuPont is still number one. Doesn't mean that they're going to be number one forever. But we, we certainly have distanced a lot of uh, the Me Too's and, and have a very strong global position in clothing. And, and probably going to be a, a question for my successor, should the company now add a third area of uh, protection? And, and should that be a product or should it actually be a service or should it be a, a software solution to improve service or training or behavior of people so that they don't injure themselves, right? So, so I think that there's uh, much more to be done here, but come back to that maybe. How long did it take you then in that regard to actually re-energize the thinking? You say you set the framework, as you said, you've had the big agenda, you're in Paris. 
How long does it, does it take to actually start seeing results? I think we saw early results in, in year two. Year three, it was starting to accelerate. And, and, and the result came initially as simplification of brand footprint. Uh, it's a lot of work, but it's, it's very actionable. The doubling down in emerging markets, hiring a lot more salespeople. Okay. I mean, our, our sales in China has increased tenfold or something like that. And most of that has come through just building year after year after year, new salespeople, new capabilities, broadening the range, setting up a warehouse, improving service and, and, and so forth. And we've done that in China and India and uh, Southeast Asia, in Brazil, all over Latin America. Mexico is in fact uh, individually the strongest market in the world for us in terms of market share and position. And it's, it's sort of been a, a consistent application of that focus. So yes, we saw um, results uh, pretty quickly uh, and then it's steadily gone on from there. We've made, I think now 12 acquisitions. It's gone well. I mean, we've been very picky. I mean, we're looking at hundreds of companies uh, and we're picking the ones that we really think will fit in. Uh, and we make sure that we don't overpay. And that means that we back out of a lot of competitive bid situations and we've lost a lot of potentially attractive opportunities to private equity because we felt they paid too much. But uh, the, uh, the 12 we have made, 10 of them have turned out to be successes. So that's a good track record uh, and we don't want to throw that out the window. So we're going to continue to be picky and, and, and make sure that the acquisitions we make have a good strategic fit that uh, the value is justified and that we have a clear path to uh, set up integration and manage the company uh, post deal making. That's really when the, the work starts. It, it's worked well for us and, and it's allowed us to build capabilities we didn't have and technologies that we brought into the company allowed us to integrate backwards in a couple of areas. Uh, instead of buying finished yarns, uh, we now are covering our own yarns. So we're buying individual fibers and we're wrapping them and, and crimping them and uh, uh, adding a lot of value to the yarns before it's put into a glove, as an example. Yes. Uh, and by the same token, we can go backwards into uh, latex technologies and chemicals and coatings and coverings and, and uh, machine making and, and, and so forth. So there's a lot there, uh, many dimensions uh, of differentiation, which is actually something we've honed in on, we, we talk about strategy in the company now as our eight dimensions of differentiation, customer proximity and how we work with customers and knowing them and solving their problems, not, not just peddling gloves, right? Brands, having brands that are trusted, product range, having the biggest, biggest range in the industry, regulatory, knowing all of the regulatory authorities and making sure that we take responsibility for that everything is regulatory approved. Yes and constantly is refreshed and renewed. Many of our competitors don't do that. Uh, we even sit on advisory committees to regulatory authorities so that we know what's gonna come next um, before it comes. And, and that's an important dimension of being ahead of the game. Manufacturing, we have invested very deliberately in manufacturing. I think my, my predecessor uh, did not, instead outsourced uh, a lot. Interesting. Uh, and we felt that uh, if we don't own manufacturing, yeah. then we will eventually get disintermediated. There will be the OEMers and there will be the customer and there will be some kind of a distributor in between. But if you don't manufacture, then who are you really? So big, bold commitment to manufacturing and that's why we're investing uh, this year 10 times more than the year I joined right. uh, in annual CapEx. It's a long journey. I mean, you look at our engineering team at the corporate level, we had four engineers in the whole company uh, when I joined, now we got 60. And then on top of that, of course, we have a, a ton of engineers at the plant level to support machines and so forth. But this is, this is the core group that envisions and designs tomorrow's machines. And they are amazingly clever and have taken us uh, so far uh, when it comes to having the best tools uh, out there. So Ansel now has these eight points of differentiation and think about it as a moat around the Ansel castle, right? Yes. And we're constantly digging on the moat to make it bigger and wider. 
uh, so that we can defend uh, and build uh, the castle to be ever stronger. So that, that's the, um, the symbology of the points of differentiation. What's the scale of Enso now, Magnus? Well, we're uh, about a two billion in sales, about um, US dollars. Um, uh, we're about four billion market cap. It's two and a half X. I think I bought my first shares when I joined the company at uh, $10 a share and we're 39 uh, now. So in, in, in that sense, it's been okay. But, but I think we, we have so much more to do and uh, we can go much further. So as a CEO, how do you, from running a global company, set the pace? Okay, that's the first part. Second part, how do you communicate to bring people along? Well, so setting the pace, I think, is a, is a combination of setting the vision. First of all, where are we going? How far can we go? And that vision, that, that goal must be, by definition, you know, bold, uh, substantive, uh, imaginative, engaging, exciting. Uh, it must be that beautiful, you know, hill that we need to take, right? And then secondly, it's communication. Why is it important? Why is it important for the company? And why is it important for you? And that you is every individual in the company. How do you fit in? Uh, what is your role? How does that role contribute? And how does it all add up to us being able to deliver on that big, bold, fantastic, engaging vision that we can all uh, stand by and feel proud of and, and, and so forth. And, and we've seen it come together, obviously beautifully with the COVID crisis. And as I said, early in our conversation, I guess you gotta love something about every terrible situation you find yourself in, right? COVID is a terrible situation but there's something to like about that too. And that is you can bring the team together uh, and the team has been more engaged about our mission now than almost ever before, uh, because our role now is more important than ever before. But if you like playing in the mud so much, Magnus, are we gonna get another post COVID new field to play in? What's gonna happen after COVID? Well, first of all, we don't think there is a post-COVID. Oh. There is a post-peak. Most scientists, as we all read and hear, think that this is going to be with us one way or the other. It's going to continue to mutate. And we now have essentially three or four really dangerous mutations. Um, and these virus mutations take to take over and, and dominate. And for now, it looks like the vaccines will work but they will only work for a year, number one. Second, uh, we don't know whether they will work against all of the mutations. Yeah, right. And we certainly don't know whether they will work against future mutations that haven't happened yet. Yep. So for that reason, uh, it is likely that we're gonna have to deal with COVID-19 and COVID-21 and COVID-23 and COVID-29 as well. And in the sense that it will be around much like influenza uh, is and annual influenza shots uh, and so forth. And there will probably be annual COVID shots in some form uh, or booster shots and so forth. So as soon as we vaccinated the whole world population, we need to do it again and again. So that's what we see. So what's our role as Ansel? Well, it's to provide protection. It is uh, provide gloves that actually sanitize themselves uh, and kill viruses and bacteria on contact. Uh, so at least you don't spread it. Mm -hmm. It is safety protocols, uh, helping customers set that up. I mean, we learned early in our plant in China, uh, already late January last year, uh, we saw what was happening in Wuhan. Yes. Uh, we had problems getting our workers back from Wuhan to start up uh, the plant in, in Chaman producing suits of all things. Right, okay. In the early days, we got help from the Chinese government to get our employees back in return for giving them a majority of our output. All uh, right. But the real lesson learned there was how do you set up a plant and run it consistently uh, in a very dangerous environment where everybody around you could be infected. Uh, so we set that up with safety protocols. Uh, we set it up with temperature controls and distancing and all that kind of stuff. And we did it 13, 14 months ago. 
And we learned from that and then exported that know-how to all of our plants. And based on that, we've actually been able to run our plants with very few COVID cases, because as soon as we have one case in one plant, we send that person home, uh, we do contract tracing, we send everybody he or she talked to home, we pay them while they're home, and we keep running the plant. So if you compare Ansel to most of our competitors, we've had far fewer cases and been able to run our plants uh, very effectively through this. And, and that know-how is quite valuable and is a know-how that we're also bringing to our customers. How do you run your plant safely? Because don't assume just because the number of cases in your community is trending down that is all gone and you can forget about it. it. It will come back. And this is a dour message to be conveying, but it's likely to be the, the truth. And um, we, we better be prepared for that. So. How did Ansel go with the logistics of it all? That's been challenging, hasn't it? It's been tough because obviously in, in some areas uh, like single-use gloves, uh, demand uh, tripled. Yeah. And it uh, increased to a point where um, it was way ahead of uh, total global manufacturing capacity. And that then led to price increases. Yes. Some of our um, competitors uh, took the opportunity. They were very opportunistic. Well, I used to get 10 for this product. I can probably ask for 50 now. And even though my cost hasn't gone up, I, I will ask for 50 anyway, because I can. And some of them asked for 100. Oh, I, I could get 100 too, because the customer is so desperate. Ansel did not do that. We instead passed on cost increases because in some cases we were sourcing finished goods and we had to pay those exorbitant prices. We passed that on, um, but we didn't put a lot of additional uh, margin in there and, and take price just because we could. And the argument being, we're in here for the long term. And if we take the, this kind of a stance and price gouge now, customers will remember and they, we will lose trust forever. Yeah. So we can't do that. And even though we could have made more money in this past year, uh, it would still have been the wrong decision to be making and the wrong action. It wouldn't be consistent with our values, but it also would be just stupid actually uh, for the long term. Uh, so, so we've been as careful as we can be. It doesn't mean that we haven't taken a lot of price increases. We have, but only because we had to, but we're also being quite fast about taking pricing down as soon as we can. For example, in clothing, we saw prices double and then it came down to near pre-COVID levels. Mm -hmm. uh, and we were as fast going down as we were going up. And that too is part of trust. And it's helping us now, actually. We say to customers, see what we did on clothing, trust us. Uh, the pricing on single use will come down as well, but you need to accept the price increase now because this is reality now, right? So uh, I think trust is so fundamental here, uh, and that's what we've been living by through a very, very turbulent environment. And it's going to continue to be turbulent for uh, years to come, we think. But Magnus, as a CEO, you've got executives around different parts of the world. But if I look at the Northern Hemisphere, it's lockdown after lockdown, again, after lockdown. How's the mental welfare of your staff and, and how are you checking in and what are we looking for? Yeah. It, it is tough. People have been home now for, for a long time. Uh, we have uh, we, we had a bit of a window in, in September when we actually brought some people back into offices and had some meetings and so forth, and that was a bit of a breather. But now, uh, and, and and we said that already in November that uh, by the time we get to March, it's it's going to feel terrible, uh, and it did, uh, and it, it it sort of still does to a degree. Uh, now, what we're seeing that changing a little bit in the U.S., we've seen our Melbourne office open up, obviously our Shanghai office uh, open up mm -hmm. uh, a while back, but uh, our Brussels uh, big office and our New Jersey offices are largely still closed. So it's, um, it, it's tough for a lot of people. So it's, it's, it's engaging the management team, constantly reaching out and checking on the team, and it's... Um, doing sort of fun stuff on video as well. It's, it's little cocktail parties, it's, um, it's celebrations, it's, uh, it's wacko stuff, but uh, you've you got to do some wacko stuff from time to time to, uh, to change it up. And, uh, and, and that's what we're doing. 
Yeah. We, we have also said that we don't expect to go back to the office full time. Ever. Oh, really? Really? Instead, uh, we're uh, expecting to uh, have a more flexible working schedule because we've learned, because we have excellent technology, we had actually invested in the Teams platform uh, about six months before COVID hit. So by the time COVID hit, everybody was practicing uh, being on Teams or like we are today, Zoom. So, so in that sense, uh, we, we had gotten used to it uh, and it's worked beautifully. And we've proven through this crisis that people can be as productive at home as they can in the office. So there's no reason to bring everybody at, back to the office five days a week. Instead, we're uh, thinking that probably three days a week is the right mix to strive for, where people will be allowed to continue to work from home two days a week. Uh, not every role can do that, uh, but most roles uh, or office type roles can. By the same token, we have to be very um, respectful and thankful to our manufacturing and R&D and, and warehouse workers who did not have this luxury, yeah. if it is a luxury. I think many, uh, many of our office-based staff don't, wouldn't call it a luxury per se, but certainly the flexibility to be at home from time to time is, is a good thing, but our warehouse workers cannot. So we have to always remember that and be thankful to them sort of drumming up the guts every morning to go to work, even though they yeah. knew and still know that there is a chance that they might get infected and so forth. It's not easy to keep the company on the straight and narrow uh, during a period like this one, but um, so far so good. Magnus, with everybody talking about what you just mentioned there, the change from five days a week, you know, to three to four days or how it's going to be structured. Uh, others would mention dilution in culture or a new form of culture. So yep. where do you see Ansel going to be in, the, in, in that regard compared to what it's been? Well, the, the foundation for our culture is uh, we're in the safety business. Yep. Um, so selling safety, selling advice and selling products to help customers stay safe is is at the core that has also always been part of how we run our own plans so we have the best safety record in our plans of any industry pretty much meaning uh, the lowest uh, ltis or stis or injury rates uh, of pretty much any company you can think of okay uh, because it's been part of our system part of how we think so given that and the passion that we all feel for, we're actually in the business of selling something good for mankind. We're not in the business of selling brown sugary water or something like that, right? This is real. So that is part of the culture. The second part of the culture as I see it is uh, a desire to do something significant, change the world kind of thing. Yep. We're on a mission to be better, to do more, uh, to be smarter, to be faster. And th that is an ingredient to the culture that we need to continue to encourage and, and, and develop. And then the, the final one is, is a caring element. This is a very caring organization. We're super global. We're sitting in all of these places around the world. They have a management team of eight nationalities in, in multiple places around the world. But we care a lot uh, about one another. If you reach out to an Ansel person in Shanghai and ask for some help on something, you will get it overnight. If you reach out to another Ansel person in, in Sao Paulo and need to find out X, you will get it immediately. And, and that's not just me. It is anyone in the Ansel network can get the help that they need because Ansel staff is unbelievably caring and supportive of one another. And that's quite a unique feature of, of the company. I've worked for many companies and I've seen many companies as a consultant before. Yes. And, and I've never seen anything like it. That degree of passion, engagement, support, and, and, and drive in, in, in a good combination. You also mentioned earlier on in your part of your platforms or your pillars, R&D. And taking place in the big bets in R&D. Has that been a, a key strategic outcome for you? Yes, uh, so, so we, we, we did a doubling of our R&D spending early on and hired a lot of uh, PhDs and technicians and engineers and so forth. Um, 
And we got so good at it uh, that we launched like four times the number of new products every year and to the point where the sales force said, stop, 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 we can't handle more new product. Right. Uh, so, so we had to slow down for a couple of years. Um, but we actually gone back on the next step now on that journey. So, so we're, we're doing the next doubling now of R&D spending. Um, and it's now a different type of R&D spending. It's, it's putting more smarts into the products. It's sort of putting sensors on gloves that will tell you things. I mean, some of us have, have, have these kinds of things, right? Fitbits that will vibrate on your wrist and, and tell you um, what's going on kind of thing, right? Gloves can do that too. Gloves can sense. You're touching a dangerous chemical. We were. Uh, your glove is about to be permeated. Change it. And, and those kinds of things. So, so we're going to see um, much, much more smarts going into the gloves. We're running pilots now with some of the biggest companies in the world to teach employees ergonomic movement. So how you move your wrist in uh, all different dimensions is so fundamental to predicting when you're gonna get uh, long-term injury. So we can actually, with software algorithms and AI, predict when that's gonna happen. Uh, and then send little buzzing signals to the employees saying, no, nope, don't move that way. So you essentially teach employees to lift right, move right, and so forth, right? So here we're talking about serious value add. Uh, and that's what I meant when we uh, talked about this a little bit earlier, that more smarts and more capabilities going into the product, it's software, it's services, and so forth. And that's very much part of uh, where this company is, is going. And that's more valuable. Uh, an ergonomic injury can cost the company $100,000 easily. Uh, so how much is it worth to avoid uh, that from happening? Well, it's worth a lot in terms of a smarter glove. Uh, instead of paying a dollar for the glove, you pay $2, um, but you get the service with it. Um, so uh, very, very exciting uh, future there. Uh, we, we launched, um, was it seven or eight years ago, a, a global innovation awards program. And we just celebrated the winners recently. And this innovation awards program cuts across everything. It's commercial innovation, it's sustainability innovation, it's, it's obviously product innovation, uh, commercial innovation, serving the customer in a new way. And this team, this year we had a hundred different teams engaged in presenting finalist solutions to uh, the awards jury, so to speak. And we selected uh, in the end about 15 winners. And the top award goes uh, to the team that came up with something that was truly uh, remarkable. And $50,000 is quite a bit of money uh, for most people and shared by a team. It's still quite a bit of money. And um, uh, so, so we, it's been a, a really important program. We, we, we're just now launching the, uh, it's the seventh or eighth season or iteration of this program. Um, so... Um, that, that too is very much part of, of the culture, uh, creativity and innovation and rethinking what we do. And, and, and of course, as part of the next step, uh, we're gonna see a lot of focus on sustainability and how we can be a force uh, in driving new solutions and new products and uh, minimize use of water and energy and so forth. Uh, so it's very much uh, a key focus here for the company at this point. Magnus, where's the shift in manufacturing going to take place? Is there going to be one major hub in the world? Is there going to be, is there a new merging hubs which are going to take over in manufacturing? What, what's the play there? It, this is, I don't know if this is controversial or not, but uh, I, I think globalization has run its course. Okay. And, and I think it's, um, it's going to shift a little bit, perhaps more to a hub and spoke model. We have some big centers of manufacturing in lower cost countries. And then you have late stage differentiation and uh, certain types of products produced closer to the customer. And maybe you have components coming from the big center and, and being used in the local facility. I mean, we saw it with Donald Trump and, and his vision for America, you know, by American first. We've seen it in Russia, a very strong Russia first movement. Uh, we, we see it 
everywhere in the world. And you've seen it through the COVID crisis as well. Well, we should be able to manufacture our own gloves uh, in, in, locally and not be dependent on imports to protect our people, right? We've seen that everywhere. So I, I think this is becoming more of a permanent feature and, and it's for two reasons. One is because you need to capture the ingenuity and capability that resides in every country. Second, it is for supply assurance. So, so there are many reasons that will drive us in this direction. And, and, and the final reason is that the um, uh, labor cost differential is getting smaller. Chinese labor cost uh, is now only half or something like that of what it is in, in, in Europe. And it used to be one-tenth, right? Yep. So, so that yep. gap has closed quite dramatically. Yep. And, and then transportation cost is going up. And, and the uh, the risk in long uh, transportation distances and so forth, we, we saw it in spades with the Suez uh, mini disaster uh, yes. recently, right? Yes. It just puts the finger on how incredibly dependent we are on this interconnected world. And uh, we're going to continue to be, into, uh, to be dependent, but, but we cannot afford to be that dependent. So, so I think we're going to see more balanced footprint uh, emerging with more local manufacturing, but still big manufacturing centers in Asia, in some countries in Latin America. And, and that, that's gonna be key. For, for Ansel, uh, we, we are big in Malaysia yes. and Thailand and Sri Lanka yeah. and Vietnam. And we're now open up probably the first greenfield site in Ansel's history in about 30 years uh, in India. Uh, so it's gonna be a, a, a big new site for us a cornerstone site. What's the sort of scale of that? And you say big new site, what's the scale, Magnus? Well, it, it's probably going to be, you know, 1,500, 2,000 workers, something like that, uh, when all is said and done. Yeah. Uh, and it depends on how much automation we put in there and, and so forth. But, um, um, but, but that's typically what a full scale uh, or mega site looks like at Ansel. Uh, and then we have smaller sites with, uh, you know, four or 500 workers. But I, I think some of those parameters would change as automation increases. But yeah, it's going to be a, a, a big site. Are we seeing the reemergence of the Cold War? The democratic nations versus the non-democratic nations seems to be talked a lot more about in recent times. I, I think there's going to be more conflict, yes, because you have conflicting directions. Or, or expression of power and influence, and they will clash and will continue to clash. It, it, it's gonna be, I think, a challenge for all companies to navigate. Uh, we certainly don't wanna be aggressively picking sides. Mm. And I think there's enough evidence of corporations starting to become political. Uh, and I don't think that's the role for corporations to be political. And we, we have to stand up for our beliefs and so forth, but there's a limit to how, how deep that should go. Uh, so uh, in Ansel's case, we're global. We love doing business in China. And it doesn't mean that we love everything that China does, but the, the same applies to almost any country. Uh, and just because you, you, you don't love everything about a country doesn't mean that you can't do business there. So, um, I, I think that's how we, we, we need to manage ourselves uh, going forward. Now, someone who has undertaken a fair amount of M&A during their career, what is the art of negotiation? To me, it's, it's always trust. You, you have to be building trust with the seller early, um, because if there is no trust, then the negotiation is going to be impossible. Uh, and the deal constraints are going to be impossible. So transparency as much as you can make it, but honesty in what you communicate and, and what you say you want to do and so forth, I think is fundamental. Ansel has been quite successful in buying family owned businesses, for example, because we establish a relationship with the founder. Uh, and we essentially say that um, uh, we, we will take care of your life's work. Uh, it will be integrated for sure, but um, many of the fundamentals that you put in place will live on. And I think that's, uh, that's a key element uh, that makes us successful. And very often a private equity firm can't say that 
but because they only uh, they're only targeting to own it five years anyway. So how can you commit to a founder and that we will take care of your baby? They can't. And as the CEO, what leading thirteen thousand plus people? Mm -hmm. How do you lead? Just on a day-to-day -day basis, pre-COVID, are you one who walks the floor, which means you're on a plane all the time? How, how, how do you actually genuinely lead? Yes, uh, it's a lot of travel. I mean, before COVID, it was 60, 70% sometimes, constantly on the road. And even then, uh, a, a lot of um, calls, um, not so many video calls, but certainly a lot of calls. Uh, since then, it's been all video, right? But I've always, uh, long before Ansel, I've always b believed in in um, reaching out into the organization and deep into the organization. So we, we have a principle at Ansel that we call the uh, um, the grandfather or, or grandmother principle, um, okay. and, and that is uh, we sign off on hiring two two levels down. But we've taken that to also mean that we should engage with people two levels down. So, so I have something like 250 grandkids in the company. Right. And these, these are people who report to uh, uh, my direct reports or to a report of my direct reports, right? Yeah. Very often they are hypos or, or um, up and comers or uh, and playing a big role for other reasons. I sort of keep tabs on them. And, and I have uh, every week, I have probably 10 or so uh, calls with my grandkids to, <laughs> to see how they're doing and what is working. And um, wh when I started doing that, uh, the, the first uh, month or so at Ansel, the, the people reporting to me were really worried about it. Well, what are you doing? What are you talking to my guy for? And what did you tell him? And what did he tell you? And even more important, now I think they're more cool about it and, and they understand that it's not too dangerous. But, but the gist of it is, it, it's a really good way to, to keep your fingers on the pulse of the company. What is really happening? What is stopping you? Um, what are the issues that we're not solving? And and very often I ask the, uh, the, the the simple question, well, if you were in my shoes, what would you do differently right now? And, and I get uh, some really good pieces of advice very often. And some of those pieces of advice become themes. And when they become a theme, it's time to act, right? Yeah, right, okay. Yeah, it, it, it's been working uh, beautifully. And, and, and now I see um, many of my um, uh, colleagues on the leadership team uh, also have their set of grandkids. And we're starting to see variants of the grandkid uh, theme where some of them are pulling together teams of people from different functions and they do a team brainstorm. These are people that don't report to them, but they still do it uh, because it's okay. Uh, and because it's a nice way of bridging uh, the company, bringing people together on a common purpose, right? So, so I think that's very fundamental to uh, running and managing a global company. You, you cannot just sit in your office. Right. And even if you do sit in your office, you better be uh, talking to people all the time uh, to get the latest and greatest on what's happening and what is not happen happening, and more importantly. What are you listening for when you're judging, have I got a good leader that I've appointed someone? What are you picking up on in your conversation? It's the, the engagement, mm. um, visibility. And if I talk to someone and, and we get to talk a little bit about a strategy or direction and yep. the person is not aware of what we're doing or yep. why we're doing something, then that to me is a signal that uh, the leader for that department or uh, region or whatever has perhaps not been communicating well enough or often enough or with enough detail and so forth. So if you do get a little bit of that perspective, is the individual informed? Is the individual understanding what is going on? And is the individual understanding where he or she fits in to the grand scheme? Uh, how important that role is for uh, the good of the company, so to speak. So, yeah, I, I think you get little signals uh, in many different ways. F fundamentally, I, um, at least these days, I don't get a lot of um, uh, warning signals or, or concerns coming out of these. It's more ideas that come out of these, ideas for new products, ideas for how we could service the customer differently or ideas for how we can change the supply planning process or something like that. So when do you actually make the time to sit down and think? Do you put time aside? 
During COVID, I, I asked my assistant to, to block an hour late every morning. And I usually just go out and walk. Uh, and that walk time is really good. Um, it's good because it's exercise, but it's also good because it's thinking time. I, I think post, uh, post COVID, COVID peak, as I refer to it, uh, when we were all back in offices and so forth, I'll probably continue to do uh, that because it is so valuable to, to have a protected slot uh, of time. But then I, I guess we all get uh, sort of pulled into uh, when we're engaged in, in a cause. It's not that you shut down on weekends either. You do to a degree, but not completely. And, and there's always a little bit of thinking time popping up here and there, right? So when are you going to make the big call, Magnus, and you've got to bring in a new idea or restructure a business line or open up, as you say, a new operation or acquire a new company, do you bounce the idea past someone? Absolutely. Uh, we, we have a very engaged leadership team, ELT, as we call it. And uh, since uh, COVID, we actually meet every other week. In the early stages of COVID, we met every week. Uh, and before COVID, we met uh, once a month or once every six weeks. So it's quite a departure. But, mm. but, but that team is very strong. And the people I've recruited to be on that team, I, I've said to all of them, your number one role is a general manager of Ansel. You are here to solve Ansel's business problems and get us moving. Number two, yes, you're also head of HR or you're CFO or you're running a business unit, but your number one job is you're leading Ansel. And that also then means that we need to engage as a team. I need to listen to their advice. I need to get their best opinion. And sometimes that's going to be a pretty diverse set of opinions. And then, of course, in the end, I need to make the call. That balancing act of engaging the leadership team fundamentally to think with you and then uh, in the end make the call on what we're going to do. And when we make the call on what we're going to do, that team needs to be 100% behind it all the time. During my uh, sort of 10 years with, with Ansel, there's been periods when we've had the leadership team not fully in line, and that's, it doesn't work. And if there's one lesson learned for me is to be less forgiving of uh, pot shots uh, after decisions have been made. It, it doesn't work because it sends reverberations through the company that are so damaging. So. Uh, I think the, the ELT we have now is, is beautiful uh, and is very much aligned. And, um, but, but even if we at some point go back to a monthly schedule instead of a biweekly schedule, uh, it's going to be key to keep that way of working and keep that openness and trust uh, working. From your position, how's the global economy? When's it going to start coming back in some decent pace? Now, it is coming back quite strongly. You may have seen the uh, U.S. Uh, jobs report, super strong. Yep. We see good activity in, in Europe in spite of the lockdowns. The automotive industry is looking pretty solid. China has been going strong for quite a while now. Southeast Asia is a bit mixed, but generally quite strong. Latin America is mixed as well. But um, fundamentally, the economy is, is not bad, and we're going to see the global economy, I, I think, IMF is expected to come out with an update and it's probably going to be updated upwards yep. to a, a global economy growth in the mid single digit, uh, which is not bad for the global economy. So I don't think we have any reason to feel sorry for ourselves. It's going to be a beautiful environment to be successful in. It's not going to be an easy one because it's going to be turbulent. We're going to have new shutdowns. We're going to have new limitations and it's going to be moving constantly. But... If you are agile, I, I think it's going to be a fertile uh, territory for a lot of success. I'm going to pick up on that one word, agile. It's the most bandied around word there is. What does it actually mean? And what does it mean to you? Quick to respond, quick to adapt to new information. Information changes all the time, mm. right? Mm. So you need to have your antenna out there to pick up data, and when the data comes in, draw the conclusions from the data and then pivot or evolve or 
stay the course as, as the case may be. So, so that to me is what agility means. Um, respond to new information and deliver the solution or the value the customer needs at that time. And for this period of time of COVID, has it actually been, without being terrible, has it been beneficial for, for Ansel in sense of market share and production and revenue? Yes, um, we have sold more gloves and more suits uh, than before COVID. Um, uh, some of that has come from um, increased demands driven by COVID and, yep. and so forth. Yep. But some of our businesses have gone in the opposite direction. Uh, if you take um, mechanical gloves, for example, for automotive and metal fabrication industry and mining and so forth, yes. uh, went down dramatically for about six, seven, eight months. Uh, and then it started to come back again. Uh, so it's not universally good. Uh, it's It's been a, a bit of a mixed bag, but more good than bad, if we can use those terms. But what is more interesting here is uh, it's solidified the commitment of the organization. We talked before about the passion and the engagement around being a safety company. Mm -hmm. It's become even stronger during this time. So in 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 a way, the morale or the culture or the commitment to what we do is stronger now than ever before. Uh, and that's made us a better company. The other uh, aspect of this is we have evolved strategy a little bit. We decided to double down in more manufacturing investment, building capacity. Good news is we actually decided to do that well before COVID. Yeah, right. uh, so that when COVID hit, we had all kinds of new capacity coming on stream. So sometimes you just have to be lucky and good at the same time, right? So, in, so in this case, uh, uh, that happened. But during COVID, we have also decided to double down in a couple of areas. Uh, since it worked so well, okay, let's invest even more then. So we're taking the opportunity of doing well to invest more aggressively for the future. Um, so we are uh, today in investing more in our future than ever before, uh, whether it's manufacturing capacity, whether it's R&D, engineering capability, uh, even branding and marketing, uh, digital reshape of the company. We're launching all kinds of new engines to service customers and make it easier to uh, shop Ansel, if you will, or to uh, self-help uh, modules so the customer can diagnose their own safety needs and those kinds of things. So. Uh, so there's a lot going on here that will help make Ansel even more impactful uh, in the medium and long term. And I mean, perfect case in point, surgical. So we're number one in the world in sur surgical gloves. Nominally, that business should be struggling right now um, because elective surgeries are postponed, right? Yeah, right, yep. Uh, you know, if you have a little growth on your leg and you wanted to remove it, you can't go in and do that right now because the hospital is busy, especially in Europe. The hospital is full up uh, to the ceiling with uh, extreme COVID cases, intensive care and so forth, right? So all of that is postponed. And yet our surgical business is growing rapidly at that. Why is that? Well, some of it is uh, can we call it um, misuse, meaning uh, some customers are using surgical gloves where they shouldn't uh, to protect against COVID. But most of it is because many of our competitors actually backed out of surgical because they could make more money selling single use oh, yeah, right. gloves. Okay. Uh, so they essentially abandoned customers left and right who then came to us and said, Ansel, can you help? And, and luckily we had built some capacity so we could. So we have taken a lot of market share from uh, weaker competitors or from short-sighted competitors who just were in it for the money. So uh, I, I think that's what we really uh, like seeing. Life science, same thing. We, we have uh, bought a couple of companies in life science. We have over-invested in life science. We've built sales forces. Um, so, so we now have a very strong position in life science globally. And guess what? Life science is seeing high demand, pharmaceutical research, laboratories, testing, vaccine application, and so forth, right? So yeah, it's, uh, it's been beneficial, but the, the more powerful element of, is, of it is what it's done to the long-term capabilities of Ansel. Mates, if I can ask you something a little bit closer to home, Australia, in that sense. 
Are we playing it smart in regards to business competing against those new markets you're talking about around the world? Are we, are we encouraging business to take risk? Are we encouraging business to invest with us? Or is it just difficult to do business? I think Australia is in some ways quite similar to Europe or the US uh, in, in that sense. Um, and I, I think there is a, a, a desire to be more of a manufacturing location. So we talked about that before, the hub and spoke model and, uh, and, and so forth. And I think that's where the, the opportunity lies. I don't think that there is a realistic opportunity for Australia to be the site where you have large glove manufacturing uh, uh, plants, right? Uh, because they're still quite labor intensive. And uh, even if you could automate so that the labor differential wasn't the key concern, latex comes from Southeast Asia. And lo and behold, it costs more to ship wet, raw latex than it does cost to ship the finished product. Yeah, right. So you have a double whammy. And then the third one is energy is more expensive in Australia than in Malaysia, for example. Mm -hmm. So no, there, there, there isn't a realistic opportunity of uh, large scale manufacturing, and, uh, but, uh, but there is realistic opportunity of service and support and, and uh, small nimble facilities, highly automated to be supporting the core site that will still sit in a lower cost location. Have we got an opportunity to play a role in R&D or being, you know, the incubators or being the, the smart thinking or the labs or is Singapore going to pick that up and leave us for dead? No, I, I absolutely. I, I think that's a, a, a big area of opportunity. And I, I think we're seeing um, in, in Australia a lot of very smart medical device, uh, pharmaceutical type companies doing really well. Uh, most of them are quite global. But much of the innovation, uh, R&D and so forth, is sitting in Australia. So uh, Ansel is not one of them. Uh, our innovation focus is sitting in Asia, actually. But, but uh, yes, I, I do think that there is an opportunity. And I would not exclude a situation where uh, we would see a, an Ansel R&D center in, in Melbourne as well. Uh, because one thing that we do know is we find a lot of smart people. And smart people is everything. So what's going to be next for you, Magnus? Well, I, I do a little bit of board work, board work uh, and, and I suspect that I will do a little bit more of that. It, it's going to be uh, boards that want to change the world too. I don't, I don't want to be a rubber stamper. Um, so uh, clearly uh, situations where there are some interesting uh, strategic challenges, tough challenges, and where the board can play a role as advisor or partner with management. Obviously, management needs to manage, but the board can play a big role. And I've seen that at Ansel. We have a really good board at Ansel, a very engaged, hardworking board. Uh, and it's, it's a bit of a role model for me when I think about what, what I might be doing in the future. Yeah, look, there's a lot of debate going on about the composition of boards and well, the role of the boards. And I think you said partnering. That's, always, that's an unusual terminology, but I could see it playing more of a discussion point now. Do you think we've got the right composition or do you see much di difference between Europe, Australia, US and how boards arrive at decisions or is there a, is there a good model that you've, you've looked at and thought, wow, if I could take a bit of that and a bit of this and build that, that best board? Yes, probably. I mean, as you, as you know, in, in, in the US, they still very often have combined CEO and chairman. Yes. But based on my perspective, it's probably not ideal um, most of the time. I, I can see situations where it would be a good uh, solution. But uh, I, I think the the balance between the CEO and the chairman is is actually quite interesting and can be quite powerful. So, so I think that's a, uh, a good sort of microcosm, what you should look for in a board. Uh, diversity is a big aspect of board work, uh, and it's tended to focus on male-female diversity, but um, I think the more important is diversity of thought, whatever the reason for diversity of thought, whether it's culture, background, experience, uh, male, female, um, uh, race, and so forth, all of that figures in. It's sort of the background and the journey we've been through. And I think you want a board that is diverse 
from the point of view of the journeys that these individuals have taken. Magnus, the last question. If you were to look back at that young man going into the Swedish Marines, what advice would you give him now? That's, that's a, 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 a tough one. I think it's, it's, um, it's a combination of patience, be a little bit more patient on certain things. But when it comes to people, it is being actually faster uh, on trusting your gut. Because once you've been in a leadership role for a while, if you don't trust your gut, then why should anybody else, right? So I, I think trusting your gut and make the move faster. If you uh, feel that a person is wrong for the job, don't try to do a, a very comprehensive remedial program and try this and angle that and so forth. Just move because your gut is almost always right. So, so I think it's a patience on the long game, but trust your gut and get it done. Uh, that, that's what I would say. <laughs> Magnus, on that, I, um, I can't ask you for any more today. It's been terrific talking to you. Thanks for dialing in all the way from, uh, from Brussels. Thank you, Greg. Appreciate it. It's been fun. Take care. And you've been listening to No Limitations.